My lecture today is about love and education. It has three parts. In the first, I will offer some general reflections on the theme. In the second, I'll discuss the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. And in the third, I'll offer you some of my own views on this topic. So I start with a quote from the German poet Goethe. We learn only from those we love. A contemporary of his, Frederick Hölderlin, also a poet, said of teachers that they, quote, give their best when they love. Yet another German, Friedrich Nietzsche, claimed, I quote, the deepest insights spring from love alone. Now, I'm not sure that these statements are universally true, but I'm convinced that there is a natural connection between love and learning that most theories of education these days either under-acknowledge or fail to acknowledge altogether. The connection forms a part of the everyday experience of students who frequently feel not only respect but affection for the teachers they learn from or the teachers who manage to educe or draw out from them their passion for a given subject matter. In John Williams's novel, Stoner, an undergraduate at a university in Missouri is about to graduate with a bachelor's science degree in the College of Agriculture and is in a state of deep confusion about what to do with his life. The last thing he wants to do is return to his parents' rural farm and work the land. During his university years, he has taken several courses in English literature and excelled in them. And in a meeting with one of his literature professors, the professor tells him, but don't you know, Mr. Stoner? Don't you understand about yourself yet? You're going to be a teacher. Stoner felt himself suspended in the wide air and he heard his voice ask, are you sure? I'm sure, Sloan said softly. How can you tell? How can you be sure? It's love, Mr. Stoner, Sloan said cheerfully. You are in love. It's as simple as that. Stoner began falling in love with literature when he started to understand the sonnets of Shakespeare and various other literary works. The subject matter may differ but the pattern is generally the same. Love comes with understanding, not superficial understanding, but what I would call a kind of essential understanding. When I begin to understand geometry and the theorems of Euclid, when I grasp their inner coherence, they draw and attract me and they fascinate me. When I begin to understand how the universe works, it becomes more enticing, and I embrace it in a way that I didn't or couldn't before. The same applies to a poem, to a political constitution, to a foreign language. Understanding, I'm suggesting, reveals the inner beauty and conformation of things, inspiring a kind of love that is unique to the learning experience. This is another way of saying that the most intense kind of learning is passionate rather than passive, driven by desire rather than duty, and in its etymology, the verb to study actually means to strive toward and to show zeal for. Studium in Latin originally meant keenness or eagerness. The medieval Italian poet Dante understood what it meant to study in this passionate manner. Before he wrote the Divine Comedy, which is the most famous and most learned poem of the Middle Ages, Dante wrote a short book called the Vita Nuova, which means the new life, which tells the story of Dante's love for a young woman named Beatrice, whom he saw as a quasi-angelic creature. Dante composed most of his early lyric poems for Beatrice, but when she died abruptly at the age of 24, he fell into an existential crisis and lost his poetic voice. In the last chapter of the Vita Nuova, 
he tells his reader that he has decided to stop writing until, I quote, I may speak of Beatrice in a more worthy manner. He would like, he declares, again quoting, to say of her what has not been said of any woman. And in order to do that, he is studying as much as possible. Io studio quanto posso. Io studio quanto posso. I study as much as I can. The last chapter of the Vita Nuova gives us a glimpse of how desire, study, and love come together in one prophetic moment. And I call it prophetic because in the Divine Comedy, which Dante began to write 10 years later, uh, after the Vita Nuova, Dante will meet Beatrice again at the top of the mountain of Purgatory, and she, her character, will guide him through the nine spheres of heaven, leading him to an ecstatic vision of God. And this celestial journey is in many ways a journey of the mind, of what Dante in his Paradiso, which is the third canticle of the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy has three canticles. It's Inferno, Purgatory, and Paradiso. Uh, and in the Paradiso, Dante speaks of something that he calls la mente innamorata, the mind in love. And that enamored mind is one that seeks with eager desire the truth of creation. And until the very end of his journey in the Divine Comedy, Dante remains a student, learning about the nature of that love that moves the sun and the other stars, as the very last verse of his poem puts it. So I move now to the second part of my lecture, which I will devote to the Greek philosopher Plato. And the reason I want to give special attention to Plato is because he was one of the few philosophers, maybe the only philosopher, who thought deeply about the role love plays in education. Both Plato and his teacher, Socrates, believed that the highest kind of learning, call it humanistic or philosophical learning, takes place not through acquisition of facts and information, but through a passionate devotion to knowledge or to what Plato called the matter of philosophy. The matter of philosophy, to pragma auto in Greek. Now furthermore, Plato believed that such knowledge call it knowledge of a higher order of being, could not be acquired through reading or writing, which don't have the power to generate the living sparks that ignite true insight and knowledge, or so he believed. In his famous seventh letter, Plato suggests that paideia, or education, in the truest sense of the term, takes place in the live presence of teachers and students, and above all, in the spoken words that are exchanged between them in their long, ongoing conversation with one another about the matter itself. A conversation, sinousia in Greek. And in one of Plato's dialogues, Socrates refers to a, quote, living and animate speech that comes forth from the soul of a teacher in real time. And this kind of speech, he declares, is not written on dry papyrus or parchment paper, but is, quoting, written on the soul of the hearer together with understanding. Living and animate, those are the key words. So too are soul and understanding. For Plato, Understanding comes alive in the student after long and devoted study in the presence of teachers and other docents. The life of the mind is first and foremost life. It's important to understand that. It is the student's animate selfhood that receives the seeds of knowledge. And a teacher may possess those precious seeds. The Greek word for seeds is sperma in this case. Yet those seeds will not grow and flourish unless the soil in which they are sown, namely the student's mind and soul, is fertile enough for knowledge. And Plato, being an elitist, believed that only a minority of uh, the young had minds and souls fertile enough for the kind of knowledge that he called philosophy. In any case, 
The important point here is that the student's living self is the spiritual ground in which a transpersonal, universal truth must sow its seed, and love is the agent of its flower. Now, the role of the teacher in Plato's view is to awaken love by enabling the student to see the radiant beauty of invisible things such as justice, truth, ideas, laws, institutions, and mathematics. To see beauty in abstract things means to understand their higher disembodied reality. And education for Plato is a long process of learning to view things with the mind's eye, of learning to see the beauty of what reveals itself again to human understanding. It's not by chance that the Greek word eidos, usually translated as form, means the outward shape of something. And likewise, idea, idea in Greek means form, or more precisely, the look of a thing. Now, let me mention another important Greek word here, and that word is philia. It is one of the Greek words for love. The Greeks had three three words for love, different kinds of love, philia, eros, and agape. Philia lies at the root of the word philosophia, philosophy, or love of wisdom. The essence of the pedagogical revolution that Socrates, and in his wake Plato, brought about in Greek education was the introduction of love into the learning process. What was unusual about Socrates in the context of Greek education where professional sophists taught for wages is, first, he did not accept money for his teaching, but more importantly, he loved each one of his students personally. Or better, he loved that formative place in the student's soul where love of wisdom could take root and germinate. Now, Plato himself was one of the beneficiaries of Socrates' love for his students. And if later in life, Plato felt the need to found a school, his famous Platonic Academy, which was the first institution of higher learning in the ancient world, it was because he felt it was necessary to create a self-enclosed environment that was hospitable to philia, where the life of the mind could flourish amid the fellowship of those who joined it. And I believe that the European, British, and American campus is, in many respects, the direct descendant of the Platonic Academy in that conception of a self-enclosed environment where fellowship and, let's say, the promiscuous circulation of love would enhance uh, the learning process. So now in the Third and last part of my lecture today, I'd like to share with you some of my own views about the connection between love and education. And in some ways, my views converge, and in other ways, they diverge from those of Plato. So, like Plato, I believe that education thrives when a certain type of fervor, let's call it a studious fervor, catches hold of a person. And like Plato, I believe that good teachers educe such fervor in the self and direct it towards something that lies beyond the self. I also believe, like Plato, that love responds to the beautiful and that the beautiful often reveals itself to and through our understanding. The honeycomb of a beehive becomes more beautiful when one, one understands the hexagon in its formal definition as an equilateral and equiangular form that is bicentric, a form that is both cyclic and tangential. And here you all know that a beehive, the honeycombs of the bee, I don't have the hexa hexagonal form. Now my views diverge from Plato in two important ways. First, I believe that reading and writing play a far more essential role than Plato allowed for. The living converse between teacher and student is crucial, I don't deny that, but I believe that books are often the best teachers and that they have a singular power to reach into that quiet, inward place that Plato called the soul. I believe furthermore that words in a book can be every bit as animate 
if not more animate, than the words spoken in classrooms, seminars, or symposia. Now, my views about love and education diverge from Plato in another more important respect. Now, for Plato, the ultimate goal of education is to direct the student's love toward transcendent truth and wisdom. And Plato's wisdom was, in many ways, at odds with both the human world and the natural world. For Plato, the natural world is deficient. It lacks true being, while the human world traffics in ignorance, false opinions, and folly, for the most part, or so Plato believed. Thus, for education purposes, uh, the teacher's job for Plato is to lead to knowledge of a higher order of reality than the one that informs our human world. And I see it differently. I believe in worldly truth, not unworldly truth. And for me, education fulfills its most crucial mandate by promoting in the student an unconditional commitment to the world. The world that existed before he or she was thrown into it and that will outlast his or her passage through it. This commitment to the world this amor mundi, or love of the world, as the political theorist Hannah Arendt called it, does not come naturally. It has to be learned through a process of taking ownership of something that at first does not seem to belong to you at all, namely the human world in its political, social, economic, and cultural institutions. I leave the natural world aside here for the moment. Amor mundi love of the world, comes into being when the self-affection of a young person undergoes a metamorphosis, expanding beyond the self in which it has its source toward the world in which it finds its purpose. Now, young love is by nature idiosyncratic and world shy. Who has not felt as freakish and isolated in one's youth as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And who cannot hear some personal resonance in the verses that open Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Alone? From childhood's hour, I have not been as others were. I have not seen as others saw. I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow. I could not awaken my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Now, the role of education as I see it is to submit this uncommon spring of self-affection to a maturation process and to mobilize it on behalf of the common world that binds the citizens of a polity together as a plurality. The uncommon spring that Poe refers to is what ultimately separates one person from another. Without the uncommon differences that distinguish one person from another, the world that comes between men, as Hannah Arendt calls it, the world is that which comes between men, that without these uncommon differences, this world would not have plurality as one of its basic constituents. The world is the locus of plurality because each of us uh, as citizens is a first person singular. Now the young have a necessarily an ambivalent relation to the world. Uh, you are thrown into it without having chosen it or built it, yet you are destined to inherit it for better or for worse. Thus you have to learn how to take ownership of it, how to assume responsibility for it, and how to love it insofar as it is your world, whether you have chosen it or not. This is the difficult but fundamental task of education as I see it. Now for world love to take root in a student, he or she must acquire a basic knowledge of how it came to be. When history is conflicted and stratified past, begins to inform the student's cognizance of the present, that student's relation to time 
to his or her being in time undergoes a maturation process. The more the present reveals itself as the outcome of the past, the more it also appears as the incubator of its future, as the parent of its future, if you want to use that metaphor. Education does not fulfill its worldly mandate by putting an electronic device in every student's hand, nor by promoting a purblind vision of the present, but by plunging students into the depths of history and pushing them toward those subterranean regions where the dead speak in their own untimely voices and where the past opens up like a landscape of future possibilities. In the John Williams novel I mentioned earlier, Professor Sloan recites a poem of Shakespeare in class and then looks at Stoner. Mr. Shakespeare speaks to you across 300 years, Mr. Stoner. Do you hear him? Well, do we hear? Do we hear the call of legacies? Legacies call out to us from the past. They call out for adoption, retrieval, and renewal. I am tempted to say that there are certain legacies that actually love you, that court your devotion, if only because without you, they have no life of their own. Have you ever felt loved or courted by a legacy? Well, now is the time to let it happen during these years of your university education. Now, a century ago, the Sri Lankan philosopher Ananda Kumar Aswami wrote, I quote, we are called from the past and make our home in the future. But to understand, to endorse with passionate conviction and to love what we have left behind is the only possible foundation for power. Again, love of the world is engendered first and foremost by understanding how the world in its present historical reality came to be. We must learn the idiolex of the dead. That is why it is important for education to resist the siren calls of the contemporary and keep open the dimension of the untimely. Since we make the future only out of what has been bestowed, education's first order of business is to foster the conditions that make bestowal take place. In his book, Matter and Memory, the French philosopher Henri Bergson defined living memory as, quote, the synthesis of past and present with a view to the future. In its ideal, education sponsors a living memory of this sort. Now, it requires a great deal of world love, of amor mundi, to take the well-being of the world to heart and commit yourself to assuring that it doesn't fall to pieces on your watch. It is that love alone that takes custody of the world's future. Wherever it comes from, we need a lot more of it in our world today. To put it in a final sentence, education teaches you to love, not yourself, but the world that made you possible and that depends on you for its future.